On an interview with Busted Open Radio, he said the following. I gave them a finish to that match. He's referring to the Sting retirement match. They looked at me like I had seven different things. I don't think Tony Khan knew that I was on (laughs) blood thinners. I've been doing all that stuff for all these years. I've had that blood clot since 2012. Tony, if he asked me once, he asked me ten times, do not cut yourself what I wanted to do. Apparently what to cut himself. Uh, I wanted these guys to have the same match, but at the end, instead of leaving my laying, uh, leaving me laying there like that, uh, just keep me on the outside the whole time. At the end, Sting, as Sting is standing there and those guys are gone, I jump on Sting, boom, boom, boom. He does one big move to, uh, to me, puts me in the Scorpion Deathlock, and we go out the way we started 31 years ago. It would have blown the roof off the joint, and it would have made me a heel, so I had somewhere to go. It's hard to get the people to get mad at me now. And then Mark Henry, uh, no, I'm sorry, there's one more thing. Uh, He said, I haven't heard back from them since. Rick, that's a great idea. We'll call you later on that. And then Mark Henry said, Rick was unlikely to hear back on that. And uh, he said, What did Mark Henry say? He said, uh, Rick Flair was unlikely to hear back on that creative. (laughs) And Rick replied with, I think we disappointed a lot of people by me not turning heel. So, see, I, yeah, I didn't realize it was all about Ric Flair, the Sting retirement. See, it's it's all Rick. Rick has to be somehow, if he's in something, he's got to be center stage. No matter if he's 75, 100 years old, he'll still want to be center stage. And I think that that bus has departed and it's not coming back. Rick, it, you, it's just... I mean, you've been 30 years past your prime, 30 years. What is 30 from 75, 45? No, you've been 20 years past your prime. I'll say that. I'll give him a little bit over 50. But then he's he, he's past the prime. So if I would have seen that, I don't know what that would have done. Wouldn't that make that – isn't that working at an angle kind of? Yeah. And that then, the heel that the heel can't come back from. Well, it's sort and it makes yeah. Sting it makes Sting put a seventy five year old man in the Scorpion Deathlock and almost killed him. And what do you say? I don't think they knew if I had blood thinners. What's that got to do with anything? It's because he was threatening to cut himself in the match as well. To I imagine, and that's yeah. and that's why Tony said, "Don't do it." Well, he probably said, "Don't take." Well, I don't know if Tony would be this cognizant to say that, but don't cut yourself, Rick. You'll take the focus off Sting, who's retiring. Okay, he was okay. Let's put this together now. He was threatening to cut himself in that match, and after it was over, if Rick Flair was bleeding all over the place, yes. It would have taken the focus off Sting, especially if Sting had done something to him. Sting wasn't going to do that. Oh my God! <laughs> do you he, know he's more he's more incoherent than I thought he was? Do you know right? The Who Killed WCW series has been and gone now, and I yeah. think for all intents and purposes, for historians, not that I'm a historian, but I sort of am, I guess. We didn't like it because. There was far more to the story, and it, and it may have even turned out that some very, very salient points were edited out. But one of the things that really hurt WCW in 1999, these are the last days where they were still pulling in good ratings, this is after the finger poke of doom, was Ric Flair, at his own insistence, wanted to turn heel. Nobody had any interest in booing Ric Flair, who was a legend at that point, legend of legend, booing him. He was just past the point where it made sense. Yeah, he's always wanting to be a bad guy still. And it didn't really make sense in Evolution, in WWE after. It didn't make sense in the late WCW years. People just want to cheer the, di- the guy. I mean, maybe not now, but he I don't think he sort of gets that. that he's an elder statesman now, and it doesn't elder make sense statesman, to do it. Elder statesman for what? Where was it? What bar the Lincoln was he years. <laughs> But he's he would see as a baby face, he wouldn't really be the center of it anymore. He wouldn't be the top heel. You know, he wouldn't be the the guy that all the cameras were on, and he was the top guy. 
in WCW for years and years and years. And once they turned him, and if he'd had any sense, he'd have been looking for these big killer heels to come in here and in there and beat the living crap out of him. So he could have went through through two big heels a year, which would give him if he had 10, 10 good heels and there was 10 good heels out there. You had the Brodies and you had the Stan Hansen's and you had the Abdullah's and you had uh, back in those days. And then the ones coming up. So he could go through five years and still be the top baby face. But no, unless he can be a heel and be the top star and do what he wants to do. I don't even think he understands the business as much as we think he does. He understands being a heel and he knows how to do that when he's in, in his thirties. You know, we had a, a formula that we did. Flair was good at it. But then when that, it was by him. Now he enters in an, an, another phase of his career, and he he never adopted that. He never adapted to that. Can he can he do anything in wrestling now? Because I mean, he can't manage. Because for whatever reason, he, he never worked with him as a manager. He can't do commentary because he can't do a podcast without eating. No, he, he can't. He can't stay drunk. drunk. I mean, he stays drunk, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. God, those podcasts were terrible. Is there any room for Ric Flair apart from the occasional one-off appearances? I mean, what could he do? No, do think nothing, nothing. He couldn't even book because he doesn't understand basic booking, and he doesn't have the uh, patience for it. And if, if some didn't, I, I'm sure that if he was backstage watching something, they didn't do exactly what he thought they should do. Yeah, he would. I, I think he'd have a heart attack for anything else. But he has very few uh, skills needed now in the wrestling business. You know, a lot of times, you know, when they move on, they go into booking. But that that's a whole skill set unto itself. You got to be able to sit down and figure this stuff. For uh, Flair was never good for coming up with things for other people. He was good at coming up things for Ric Flair, but never for other people. And he, he wouldn't have made it. <clears throat> I remember Flair had the book there one time. In WCW, yeah, but he was part yeah. of a committee, wasn't he? He was sort of the head of a committee of writers. Well, he was the head of the committee, and it didn't go. Then it went, what, what years were that? They were going down, right? Yeah, we'd, I don't know if it was 89, 90, 91. He may have had a couple of different stints as head booker briefly. But, I mean, it seemed to chop and change between Flair and Dusty and Ole. Ole. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite tough to sort of uh, keep keep right on the timeline of that. Well, the the booking jobs, they – you run <clears> – <throat> excuse me. <clears throat> you run out of a time limit on them too. You have a certain window to get in it, but to be a booker, you got to still be kind of the same age range as a lot of your talent. I mean, years ago, you could be a lot older, but with WCW in those days, you know, D Dusty fit, only fit, actually Flair fit as far as the age group and the time group, but... It was the, it was the, uh, the style of booking they bring with them. And I don't, and Flair never brought it. I don't think Flair ever had it. So he gave me a finish one time I worked with him in, I only worked with him twice in my career. I think I worked with him in, I forgot, Lakeland, Florida. Mm -hmm. And I worked with him in Sarasota. Lakeland, he almost killed me because I was working like seriously on the job at the office or going to the towns or booking the town that night. I was working like 14 hours a day, maybe more. So when I went to Jacksonville, we, we went like 20 minutes. I damn near died. <laughs> 
I was literally begging him to pin me. At one point, <laughs> I decided to go out of the ring and just stay out there with my leg because I was I was just blown up because I was just out of gas. Not because I was out of shape, because I was, I was just worn out. So come Sarasota, I said, this is not going to happen. So I rested up, and we got through that match pretty well. So, so I was the booker, and and did did I go over Flair even by DQ? No, I didn't. I had him beat me. So because I wasn't the one, I was thinking, well, if I'm here in a year or if I'm here in six months, I won't hurt my my opponents for him because I'll just I'll just have him beat me. Cause I was kind of older then anyway, I didn't want to work anyway, but, but with flair, you know, he was always in good shape and you can say that for him. Still do deadlifts that, and stuff. Well, the guy that could, that could drink like he drinks or was drinking back in the day and then go in the ring. Like, you know, he was a, he was a working machine. He was, but that's just physically, mentally, totally, di totally different story. Right.